I think the move was pretty expected. Um, it was just a matter of time when it would be, again, reinforced. The digital asset industry um, has known about this for some time, and crypto exchanges um, and crypto mining firms um, uh, have known that it's prohibited in China. So most crypto firms um, can't even get through the great firewall. So their services aren't even offered in China. Um, so it's not a matter of them being prohibited. Um, but this time uh, it was quite explicit in terms of PBOC coming out to make the announcement. And therefore the company that I work with, um, the Hashkey Group has, um, has very smartly opened in Hong Kong uh, and settled its home offices in Hong Kong. And therefore we have continued to focus our activities in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan, and where there are jurisdictions with regulatory guidelines on digital assets. Um, I think what's really super interesting is the fact that this came out from the PBOC directly. And um, it's a very, very important government body. It's the regulator of uh, Chinese banks. And it's very high up in the Chinese hierarchy if you look at how the government works. And it really sends a message about the seriousness of uh, their directive. So not expected, but uh, I think it's something um, that China did want to do. And now they've made it undoubtedly clear. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not great at reading Chinese, um, but I'm looking at the English translations. And the PBOC, it's valued at three trillion US dollars. Um, it has the financial clout and power to enforce the rules, and it's the central bank. So if you look at the words, um, it's very serious about monitoring uh, its monetary base and making sure that payments and investments in, ch in China, as well as ensuring payments and transfers are properly managed. Um, they're also really worried about volatility and they're worried about um, uh, funds coming in and out of China. They want to be able to track that. So they're worried about digital assets and um, social stability. And digital assets means to them going around the system and buying um, digital assets. And therefore, they want to stop that. And if you're going to buy digital assets, it's going to be probably the CBDC or the central bank digital currency. So what is paramount is knowing um, who is buying what um, and making sure that social stability and protecting the investing public uh, are all important factors. And that's the other reason why that um, the uh, PBOC has issued this directive and making sure that the banks who are intermediaries um, are, are a part of the process and enforce the rules. So I think personally that's what I think. Um, it has to do with giving fair warning to the payment system and that government um, will enforce um, their rules this time. I think that this time it's actually very, very serious. Um, and not that every other time wasn't serious, but this time, because it came from PBOC, it was extremely serious. Um, for most of the digital asset exchanges that operate um, globally, they are aware of what's going on in China. Um, and most of them have already mended their procedures. And you'll note that two very high profile exchanges that operate in China have already made high profile announcements of amending their rules. Um, so what's going to happen is I think um, most global exchanges will be very careful of taking on Chinese clients. And um, in fact, they won't take on Chinese clients directly. Um, whereas possibly if Chinese clients from China have other passports, um, that might be uh, uh, the only workaround. But um, if you're Chinese, I think the government has just basically said you're not allowed to trade crypto and it's it's pretty clear so it'll be up to the firm and their rules and regulations on how they do this um, and it'll be interesting to see um, how regulators around the world if any uh, will take part in enforcing this um, but i think uh, pboc through the banks uh, as well as um, other regulators around the world uh, will be looking to see how this all pans out for China, um, I guess it's better for regulatory clarity. Um, of course, it's not good for the digital asset industry, um, but for China, 
which counts social stability as its number one uh, issue and making sure that uh, payments uh, and making sure that funds are tracked in and out uh, is very important to the social stability of China. So for China, it's good for business uh, and people wishing to invest in crypto. Uh, it may not be um, so good for them, um, but uh, I think overall, at least there's clarity in the rules and there's clarity in what China is going to do next. Um, and you can see the different initiatives that are happening right now as China steps up social stability issues. So paramount um, to, to the uh, policies there is basically social stability. In terms of digital assets, I think they've said it pretty clearly. Um, it'll be, if, if, if I were still a regulator, I would probably take on a couple of high profile cases in China and crack down and send a message to the market if I were still a regulator. So if I had a crystal ball, that could be one thing that would happen just to prove the point when a regulator uh, puts in a new rule. They'll give some time for people to comply but they may send a message by cracking down um, and pick um, some, something that, that has not followed the rules and make an example of it. So unfortunately, that's how most regulators around the world um, uh, enforce the rules. And that is their job. And uh, no, it's around the world. It's UK, US, everywhere around the world. Yep. So um, if I were them, possibly that's what I would do if I were still a regulator. I wish I had a crystal ball and I would love to speak to some of the colleagues that I used to work with at the CSRC about this, but we can't really gaze into the future or gaze even present of what their intent of this regulatory announcement is. But what it will do is um, make it more transparent of, uh, and less confusion for what the CBDC, or what is the central bank digital currency, is. Um, the digital yuan has been worked on for some time uh, in China, and it will be issued in due course, and that will um, be one major issue. There's been a lot of discussions also um, about climate, so um, this may this crackdown may contribute in um, fulfilling uh, China's uh, climate targets, and you've seen um, the shutdown of uh, the plants and uh, the severity of the power uh, uh, grid being uh, looked at right now. So the supply chain has actually been affected in terms of power. So uh, mining, as you know, um, actually takes up quite a bit of energy, and I think this is another area that China may be cracking down on because, of course, they want to get to zero carbon uh, very soon, and they have their targets, and they're serious about those targets. So this may be one. They want to be carbon neutral by 2060. And then finally, they want to stop um, illegal cross-border transfers of assets. Um, this, this has been something that they've been continually saying. Um, and finally, to protect Chinese investors uh, and the investing public. So. I haven't heard it directly from some of the people that I knew in China, uh, but if I had a crystal ball, I think these were some of the things, but I can't speculate. Um, but if you look at the whole thing as a whole, that's probably some of the reasons why. I think going forward, Hong Kong will continue its autonomy um, and it'll continue to maintain its autonomy um, in its financial and administrative affairs. And that was granted in the basic law um, it's also a major financial and business hub, so it makes sense for Hong Kong to continue as being um, an interface for Chinese blockchain technology um, to find international uses and customers. Um, so uh, even though you hear a lot about people moving back and forth, I think Hong Kong is still going to be the capital for blockchain uh, and um, uh, financial uh, uses. And of course, the virtual asset service provider license that the SFC has um, announced and the whole regime that the SFC has announced, um, they're following it and um, they're going through with it. So uh, whilst 
the rules have just been articulated again. They've been in place for a while in China, but Hong Kong continues. Um, there is a new regime that will come in probably next year or the end of the year, which will uh, license other uh, cryptocurrency or digital asset providers. Uh, and that's under the money laundering uh, uh, reporting ordinance. Uh, so there'll be a new regime there probably next year or the end of next year. Um, that's slowly winding its way through uh, legislation. The w area where probably I would see the effect would be in terms of Chinese customers um, uh, not being able to open accounts, um, and that probably will be an impact to some businesses. But it's a really big world out there, and international firms uh, 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 turn to all over the world for its customers. Um, but it still continues to be one of the most dynamic markets. So China is the place to be, um, and it has many, many blockchain developers, and um, it's the leader in global uh, blockchain development applications. So I think that will continue. But how it will affect our, our neighbors in Asia, um, I think the Japanese market has already listed its um, uh, uh, licenses. They're working. In fact, Hashki got its licenses just recently with, at the same time as another major U.S. Uh, 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 digital asset firm. So you're seeing Japan, uh, Korea come, has come up with um, new digital asset um, rules. So all the other jurisdictions are already offering digital assets and uh, they're coming out. Of course, Singapore also. Um, so they're all coming out with uh, rules and clarity for uh, investors that wish to deal in digital assets. As the digi digital asset industry becomes more regulated, I think Hong Kong becomes more attractive um, because it's a financial center that's governed by rule of law and it provides a level playing field for industry participants. So Hong Kong has always had people moving in and out and in and out. And I think time will tell in terms of, if you see, we have 602 financial services, securities brokers and futures brokers in Hong Kong. Um, and um, that number has increased with um, new broking and family offices coming into Hong Kong. So we have a really vibrant financial services industry. And I think digital asset firms um, would do well to stay here in Hong Kong uh, and grow here uh, because there are uh, clients and there are international clients and there are family offices that are moving uh, and setting up in Hong Kong. So we've moved our global, uh, we meaning Hashkey, have just moved our global uh, headquarters to um, the Central Financial District. You probably saw that in the news. So I'm in the process of doing our renovations right now. So we're clearly strongly um, commit, uh, committed to our presence here. And we believe um, uh, a number of regulated uh, firms are definitely going to stay here. Um, Hong Kong is really convenient. Uh, and um, well, as soon as these quarantine and or other issues and COVID goes away, it's going to be even more convenient. So I think um, uh, we, are, we are a key financial center and one that's here to stay. And I think uh, we, we need to keep upping our game to remain attractive because you're right, all the financial centers around the world want a piece of the action and uh, want to attract people. Um, case in point, Singapore, uh, and they're doing their darndest to try to attract um, digital asset and financial services players to Singapore. Um, but there's nothing left to chance and there's always a purpose for when the Chinese government does something. And this is something I do know. So um, this may be presaging something that's going to happen in the future. I already know that um, they're already testing the uh, uh, central bank digital currency, as are a number of governments around the world. So we, and even in Hong Kong, are testing with um, Thailand and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia with different markets. So we ourselves have a CBDC. And China has been already testing it. It's come out to say that it's already testing it. So I think um, there is a reason for that timing. Um, but again, I can't get into the minds of uh, the government, but I would think that it is, it is not coincidental. 
So um, by coming out with a strongly worded uh, announcement, uh, it's probably going to presage something. I do too. There, there have been 22,000 firms in China working on CBDC. 22,000, that's a lot of firms. And that's a lot of resources um, put together and they're already testing it. Um, I'm not telling you anything secret because it's been in the news. And it really makes sense because you're saying, look, this is we're going to launch this. This is really important to us. We don't want anything else to dilute this. This is it. Um, and this is the grand plan of what China wants to do to have this digital currency. And it'll be one of the first in the world to actually launch. So it's actually quite exciting. And I mean, you've been to China recently. You can't pay for anything with cash anymore. So I think um, it's 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 good timing and it's about the right time, especially because the Olympics are coming up too. Um, so um, the Olympics, uh, as well as the next steps of the Chinese um, plan, is actually already happening. So um, I think that's being put in place now.